Welcome, everybody. We're going to start. Now, if you don't mind moving up to the front, we've got some seats in the front row. Push this way as best you can. You can see things a little more clear. I see a lot of familiar faces, people who have followed the Viva Laredo project. We appreciate you coming back. As you know, this is, this is our design studio for the next two weeks as we work on the Viva Laredo Comprehensive Plan project. Um, we're very excited to have on the team and speaking tonight, uh, Jeff Speck. I've had the opportunity to work with him on a few projects and um, he's, he's, a, he's a very important part of uh, the Viva Laredo project. He's a noted uh, architect and urbanist. He's been working on transportation and livability. Walkability is a concept that he has in many ways helped all of us understand better. At first, you understand walkability, but the reality is it's a lost art, and Jeff has been helping us discover it. He is the, uh, the co-author of Suburban Nation, The Rise of Sprawl and the Decline of American Dream, as well as the Smart Growth Manual. The Smart Growth Manual, I think, is the one critical book that, that all of you, the planners of Laredo, need. It's, it boils everything down into very concise and pithy messages the Spark Growth Manual. It, Jeff's latest book is, um, is uh, The Walkable City, How Downtown Can Save America One Step at a Time. Jeff spent a career uh, helping cities to thrive. I think we're all lucky to be working with him. I think we're lucky to have him here in Laredo. And so let's introduce him with, uh, with a, a, a nice applause. Thank you. Thank you, Jason. And Myra was running to turn the lights down. You don't have to run, it's okay. Um, well, it's great working with Dover Cole, who I've, I've worked with many times, uh, and with the team here. And yeah, I'm gonna be kind of in the dark. Sorry about the filming. Um, but it's important that you see the slides. This is a very visual show. So in fact, I don't care if you see me or not. Uh, I've got about 300 images to show you. I plan not to speak for much longer than an hour, maybe a little longer, we'll see. But I promise not to bore you, I will keep it lively. And um, I, I wanna start, well, first of all, this, this, um, in this very important two-week workshop, and I should say, I've only worked in my entire life on one other project that was a full two weeks. So this is very serious. Um, but in this two-week workshop, my talk has been um, billed as how to make Laredo a great place to live. Um, so that's what we'll call tonight's talk. Oh, I don't want to have feedback. I was thinking I would stand, yeah, bad idea. I'll stand over here. Um, who was here, oh, wrong advancer. Who was here in January when I gave this talk? Perfect, so I'd say a little less than a third of you. Um, a little more than a third of my talk is going to be the same. <laughs> but the rest of it will be new. Um, there are certain things I felt, were s because so much of the audience was new, there are certain things I felt I, I just needed to say again. Um, I have a little more time tonight, and I have a better understanding of your city. Um, so I want to talk s about some other things as well. But I have to say, for those of you who have heard me talk before, I've heard myself talk like hundreds of times, so if, you, if that bothers you, just know that it's worse for me. But in fact, uh, this material is so interesting and so exciting that I could do it a hundred more times and I per personally would not be bored. So that talk was called Towards a More Walkable Loretto, and I think we're going to call this talk Towards an Even More Walkable Loretto, and let's not waste any, any time. Uh, I give talks on the walkable city, and most of my talks are either about uh, why we need it or how to do it. And last time I spoke to you only about how to do it, so tonight I want to spend a little bit of time on why it's so important for us to make our cities more walkable. It was a really interesting experience as a planner and talking about walkability from a planning perspective, which was a design orientation, it was an aesthetic orientation. 
but watching how people reacted or frankly didn't react when we explained the need for walkability from the goals that we set forward as planners. And then to experience over the past 15 years, or really kicking in about 15 to 10 years ago, these three other groups who people really listened to, the economists, the environmentalists, and the epidemiologists, they all started talking about, they all, start, they all started talking about walkability on their terms and got much more reaction from the public, much more coverage, much more interest, and I would argue much more change. And so in my mission to share walkability with others and make it more normal, I've actually just studied what they've said. And, and the first part of my book, Walkable City, is called Why Walkability? And there's a chapter on economics, there's a chapter on environment, and there's a chapter on health. Because these are the compelling reasons why we need to have more walkable cities. The economics discussion is a kind of a scary one. In the US from 1970 till now, in 1970 we spent 10% of our wealth, 10% of our income typically on transportation, on moving around. What we did between 1970 and the present is that we, or I should say 2010, is that we doubled the number of roads in America. And what that accomplished, perhaps contrary to intention, is we now spend 20% of our wealth on driving. So what we accomplished by doubling the roads was doubling uh, our, the burden that transportation po poses to us as Americans. This is a really interesting, oh, and I should also say, working Americans, as defined by the um, US government, are paying, as, and we saw this tomorrow, it applies to Laredo, the typical Laredo citizen is paying as much for transportation as they are for housing, and that's rather unprecedented. And for poor Americans, as so defined by the US government, they're paying 40% of their income on transportation because they're burdened by this obligation of driving absolutely everywhere, and of course, driving is the most expensive way to get around. Now, it's not only expensive for the individuals, it's expensive for society. And this is a really important economic chart here because it shows you the externalities. It shows you the things that society has to pay that you don't pay. And of course, society builds roads, society provides transit, and society builds sidewalks. But what's really interesting, for those of you in the back, maybe difficult to see, is that for every dollar you spend walking, that might be buying sneakers or something, I don't know. But for every dollar you spend walking, society pays a penny to support that. Every dollar you spend biking, society pays eight cents, probably for bike lanes and other things. If you spend a dollar on a bus, society's, society's paying a buck fifty. But if you spend a dollar driving, society is paying nine dollars and twenty cents. And that's because of the expense of the roadways, the expense of the policing, the maintenance, the cleaning, the hospitals, and all the other things that come out of our driving economy. So we admit as planners, we accept, we celebrate that mobility is wealth. That, you know, moving around is really important to our economy, but there are different ways we can encourage people to move around. And if you're a city or a state or a federal government, you should want people to move around in the way that it costs society the least. So that's an important economic argument for governments investing in non-automotive mobility. And then the other part of the economic environment, uh, the uh, economic discussion, is just a very uh, optimistic one, which is that people really want to live in cities now. And people are moving, as you know, particularly millennials, and empty nesters are moving back to the city. But they're not moving back to every city. You know, they're moving to walkable cities. And if you look at walk score, which rates every community in the US by its walkability, if you look at walk score and compare it to apartment and home sales and apartment and home values, you see that the urban life that people are moving to is walkable urban life. So the question isn't whether people are moving back to the city or into the inner city. The question is, are they moving back to your city? And whether or not you attract that talent, those millennials who can move wherever they want, and you attract those empty nesters who have extra money and no longer have to spend it on their kids, will be based on whether you're walkable or not. So in a nutshell, that's the economic argument. 
The environmental argument is a pretty trenchant one. It's, of course, the, the, the periodic, people think that climate change means that the water is going to slowly rise. Just every day it'll get a little higher. But of course what it means is we're having more frequent, more severe storm events and they're going to become more and more frequent and more severe like Hurricane Sandy here in New York. Now the environmental movement in the U.S. has historically been an anti-city movement. It's been very pro-nature, you know, the Sierra Club on down. Historically, America's been very kind of pro-rural and anti-city in its philosophy, all the way back to Thomas Jefferson, who said, cities are pestilential to the health, to the liberties, to the morals of man. If we continue to pile upon ourselves in cities as they do in Europe, we shall become as corrupt as they are in Europe and take to eating one another as they do there. That was Jefferson. So this kind of aversion to city life, and this is Chicago you see here, only got stronger when we started talking about climate change. Because what you see is we measure carbon per square mile. And this is a map of Chicago. And what this carbon map shows us is city bad, suburbs okay, countryside great. Because of course the more people there are in any given place, the more carbon is being emitted. <coughs> Until some, some smart environmentalist said, is that really the right way to measure carbon footprint? Because there's only so many of us in the US at any given time, and we can choose to live where we have the lightest footprint. So what if instead of measuring per square mile, we measure per household? And the maps just flipped. And this is why the environmentalist movement has flipped, really turned on a dime, and said the most environmental place to be in the US, or anywhere really, is in the inner city. The denser, the better. Because you can see, the closer you are to the city center, the less you're driving, the less air conditioning you're using, the less heating you're using, all of that is happening to make cities really the answer to our environmental crisis. And walkable cities all the more so, of course, because people are driving less in them. So there's this whole, I always, I always laugh when I see this billboard um, that was in the metro in DC. It's an ad from Chevron saying, I will leave the car at home more, which is kind of like Burger King saying, I will not eat meat, right? on their billboards. But, you know, it's a great idea. You do your part to fight global warming by driving less, but when this is where you live, which is where so many Americans live, in auto-dependent sprawl, you really don't have that choice at all. And then finally, the epidemiologists, and I, I like to say the best day to be a planner in America was August 7th, 2004, when two epidemiologists and a planner Frumpkin, and Frank and Dick Jackson, who's a wonderful speaker, came out with this book called Urban Sprawl and Public Health. And while we had been shouting into the wilderness about all of our planner problems with sprawl, these doctors, these epidemiologists, came forward and said that sprawl is killing us. That the reason we have the first generation of Americans who are expected to live shorter lives than their parents is because we have built out of existence the useful walk. We're no longer getting any exercise as a matter of course in our daily lives because of the sprawl, auto-dependent model. And so, obviously, you know, obesity is not the problem. It's all the illnesses that stem from obesity. But we have a society that's become tremendously overweight. And this is why, because it's okay to drive to the parking lot, to take the escalator to the gym, to get on the treadmill, so you'll exercise. But of course, people don't do that for very long. Right? This is a map of uh, different countries around the world. And this is the green is the percentage of walking, biking, and transit. And red is the obesity rate. And you can see that it's an inverse relationship and also that the US is, is losing. And then, of course, there's car crashes. This is this man being interviewed after an accident, like right after. Um, but <laughs> I love the web. So, <clears throat> you know, uh, people don't talk about car crashes when they talk about health because it just kills you. But in fact, a lot of people are injured permanently in car crashes or killed in car crashes. And um, here's another chart, which is driving standards. And this is road traffic deaths in selected rich countries. 
and you can see again the US, Belgium, Slovenia, New Zealand, all the way down to Sweden, that the US is losing because so many of our streets are highways and so many of our miles are spent driving and not walking. But then even if you look in the US, there's an amazing disparity. So car deaths per year per 100,000 in different cities. In New York, it's 3.9. In San Francisco, it's 4.0. But in Dallas, it's 9.8. And in Orlando, it's 19.4. And these measures are principally a function of how suburban the city is and how much you're driving on highways. There, I don't have a number for Laredo. It's not on the list, but I'm guessing it's pretty darn high. It's probably somewhere between these two. So we take it for granted that you're risking your life when you go on the road, but in fact, the kind of city you live in has a profound impact on how likely you are to um, not survive that experience. And then there's the issue of equity, which plays across all of these categories, but this is the inequality of who dies in car crashes. And you know these are college grads, some college high school grads, less than high school. And you can see that it's our less educated and therefore less wealthy Americans who are dying at more than double, I'd say triple, triple the rate of, oh actually I'm sorry, triple the rate of high school grads, but look at college grads versus, it's really, it's really profound. It's one, right, one for college grads and 7.5 for less than high school. So it's our poor Americans who are dying at a much higher rate as a function of this system. Because, you know, they live in this environment. And it's, you know, we build these, these cities, really, right? This is a place. It's not just a road, but this is the heart of a community. And we build these cities where people live. And they're constricted to this style of life. I should say quality of life, which, you know, these two images are the same as far as I'm concerned. So those are the three categories. And um, together, they make a very powerful argument for making our cities more uh, walkable, and frankly, as an individual, for moving to more walkable cities. So um, that becomes a goal that outlines the rest of my work. Um, I did a longer version of that talk that you've just heard, and it's on TED.com. So if you want to show your colleagues, if you want to hear a little bit more about those three compelling reasons to be more walkable, you'll find it at TED.com under my name, which has a K at the end, Jeff Speck with a K. So. I want to now get into how to do it, since we've decided it's so important. And um, we begin with this presumption that walkable places are thriving places. And we ask the question, if that's the case, how do you get people to walk? Which leads to what we call the general theory of walkability. A little bit of a joke, but um, it is a theory, which means it's a, you know, it's a hypothesis that we're continually, continually testing and modifying. And what we believe to be the case, based on our experience in cities, is that, um, oh, and it, it's, it's kind of the organizational structure of the rest of my book, which is called, um, well, it's actually, it's not called anything. Um, but the main part of my book is all around this theory, which asks the question, then, in America, in which driving is so easy, and relatively, for us, so cheap, because you're not paying the full cost of driving, most of the, as, as that earlier graph showed, most of the costs of your driving are being borne by society. So it's what economists call a free good. You're not paying the full cost, so you use it as you do it as much as you can. And the car is sitting there in the driveway between you and everything. You just fall into it. If you own a typical American sedan, four fifths of the cost of, of having the car are just owning it, and only one fifth is driving it. So the more you drive, the less each mile costs. Because the fixed costs are so great and the variable costs are so small, the smart thing to do if you have a car is to drive it as much as possible. So in this condition, then, how do you get people to walk? And the simple answer is that the walk needs to be as good as the drive. So for the walk to be as good as the drive, the walk has to do four things simultaneously. It has to be useful, it has to be safe, it has to be comfortable, and it has to be interesting. And that's the structure of my book, and it's the structure of the rest of this lecture. So the useful walk is the story that we new urbanists all learned from our mentors, Andre Duany and Elizabeth Plater Zyberg who really created this new urbanist movement. And Andres used to tell, used to give this talk that he called the story of planning, you know, the planning profession. And he'd remind us how it was, you know, the profession was created back in the, in the 18th century, no, early 19th century, when people were choking on the soot from these dark satanic mills, 
And the planners, who weren't yet called planners, said, hey, what happens if we move the housing away from the mills? And in fact, lifespans increased dramatically and immediately. And the planners were hailed as heroes. And we like to say they've been trying to repeat that experience ever since. So the onset of Euclidean zoning, the separation of the landscape into large areas of only single use. And we now all know this is wrong. Like they teach us in planning school that this is wrong now. But it so happens that whenever I go to a place to do a plan, and I land, and I look at the site that the plan is supposed to go on, there's already a plan on the site, and it looks like this. Most of America has been zoned into large areas where the, the retail doesn't touch the office, and the office doesn't touch the medical office, and the low-density housing doesn't touch the high-density housing. And it's a recipe. It guarantees that the walk will not be useful, because the other uses are too far away, right? Now, I was an art, art history major, and they say that's not a particularly useful uh, career or, or major, uh, but I can tell you, you don't want a Rothko, you want a Seurat, right? Seurat was the pointillist. The more confetti-like, the more smaller the pieces of zoning that you have, if you're going to zone by use at all, the more walkable your community will be. And of course, the community in America where the most people walk has the finest grain of zoning. And this image of Manhattan is even misleading because that red color there that you see all around here, this is vertically mixed use. So the first rule is mix your uses tightly. Which gets me to the story I always have to tell wherever I go. I've been telling it for 20 years and Andre Stuani before me for probably another 10. Which is the main thing to understand about planning as you build new places. And Laredo is growing, and whatever, the, whatever the condition of its downtown, it's continuing to annex new territory. It's continuing to build new stuff on the city edge. And there are only two models that that land can follow. Only two ways to make community. Now, I should say, there's 100 different ways to make a city, but there's only two models that we've tested by the thousands. And one is the traditional neighborhood, and the other is suburban sprawl, period. The traditional neighborhood is defined as being uh, compact, diverse, and walkable. And sprawl is defined as the opposite. It's compact. This is Newburyport, Massachusetts, near where I live. Um, it's actually several neighborhoods. Each one is about a five minute walk from edge to center. And you find that throughout history and across cultures, about a half a mile across for a neighborhood. It's diverse in that there are places to live, low density and higher density, places to work, places to shop, places to worship, places to recreate. Most of your daily needs are within walking distance, and that's super important, as I've suggested. And then the third category is walkable for reasons we'll get into, but because there's so many streets, no one street needs to be very big. Now, sprawl, the, as the name tells you, is not compact, right? It's not diverse. Whole square miles will hold just the same use, sometimes just the same, ha just the same house over and over again. Um, and notice this. Very few of the streets actually go anywhere. They're loops or they're cul-de-sacs. And because so few of the streets connect, those few that do have to handle all the traffic, and they're designed around the single goal of handling as many cars as possible. So they become noxious. They become what we call automotive sewers and see the houses turn their backs to them. There's not a single address on this street. Think about how wasteful that is. A whole street with not a single address on it. And you won't let your kid out on it because of the volume and speed of the traffic. So that's the model of sprawl. And it's fun to break sprawl down into its constituent parts, the places where we only live, where we only work, where we only shop. Schools now supersized, and I, I I hope this isn't happening here, but there's this tendency in communities now to consolidate, to take schools and make them together and make them bigger, which is efficient. But you know, this, the, the uh, problem is that when you consolidate, you separate. The bigger a school is, the further away from you it is because the larger area it's serving. So you know, this South Florida school, look at the ratio of the parking lot to the building, and all, that's all you need to see to know that no, no child has ever walked to this school, no child will ever walk to this school. In fact, the seniors and the juniors are driving the freshmen and the sophomores with the death rates to prove it. And also, you know, athletic facilities, Weston, west of Fort Lauderdale, is very proud of its eight 
soccer fields and eight baseball diamonds and however many tennis courts. But, you know, no one's ever walked to this facility. And in fact, this is why we have the soccer mom in America. Because, you know, when I was growing up, I could walk to one soccer field and one baseball diamond and, you know, three tennis courts. I didn't need my mom to drive me. But here, even the kid that lives here, it's a one-mile drive you know, by, the, by the speakers to get you around to the facility. It's just the wrong model. But it presumes, when you presume universal automotive ownership, you guarantee universal auto enslavement. There's no other way to get around. So, you know, the part that we forgot to count when we added it all up, if you separate everything from everything else and reconnect it only with automotive infrastructure, then our superhighway system, which was created as a, um, you know, commerce way and a vacation way, essentially becomes a commuting way. And that's the burden that we suffer through. So I always tell people, you know, for some, for some this is the American dream, but just know that it's a two-part dream. You can't have this without this. Two things are part of the same package. You know, often to absurd extremes, the investment that we make in our horizontal infrastructure, robbing our vertical infrastructure. You know, our schools and churches look like, you know, warehouses. But God forbid if our street system isn't gold-plated. Because if you have to sit more than one light, if you have to sit for more than one cycle at any given light, you just want to kill yourself. So, of course, we have to make sure that never happens. And the experience of being a driver is no fun at all. This is not Photoshop. Walter Kulash took this picture. And there's a reason for it, but I can't really explain. It's stressful on families. Part of the uh, Urban Sprawl and Public Health book talks about divorce rates being higher in suburbia. Um, every 10 minutes you add to your commute, you are 10% less likely to participate in civic life in your society, in, in, your, in your community. Um, it's hard on families with all the driving we have to do. And of course, driving is no fun, and being a pedestrian can be worse. So these are the two models. And as Laredo grows geographically, it's very important to understand that you have a choice to make. You know, As you annex new territory, as you create new master plans, you can do this model where there's uses are separated, on the collector road, or you can create a network of many streets. And the great irony of sprawl is that while it was designed for cars, it actually works worse for cars. You can't have any real density here before it starts choking. And if there's one engine fire on the collector, the whole system shuts down. But in a properly networked condition, like in much of your historic city, a problem here, if you're trying to get from here to here and there's a problem here, you just go around it. There's a million choices to make. So it's a superior solution for walking and also for driving. And there are parts of Loretto, it's a little bit hard to see this image, but parts of Loretto are developed according to the suburban model on the left. And you see here um, cul-de-sacs, cul-de-sacs, loops, housing area, shopping area. Um, but then, of course, parts of the city are the dream, the traditional networked mixed-use neighborhood. And to be honest with you, that's the, that's the place where there's the most opportunity for walkability. Now, this comprehensive plan is for the entire city of Loretto, and we're doing everything we can to bring more walkability and bikeability to the entire city. But that, there's, there's only a small part of the city where the walkable quality of life in all of its beauty is truly available, and that's in your old neighborhoods because they have the right bones to accomplish that. So when you look at an older part of a city, and you won't remember we're on this first category of the useful walk, you want it to be as useful as possible, you ask the question then, what uses are missing or underrepresented in that part of the city? And in most American downtowns, and certainly, most certainly in yours, housing is very underrepresented. And the closer you can get to a, the closer you can get to a jobs housing balance, the healthier your downtown will be. And when you bring more housing back, as we've seen in many places I've worked, like Oklahoma City, you bring the housing back and the other stuff starts to get good again. Jane Jacobs, writing about Wall Street in the early 60s, and Wall Street was a different place in the early 60s, she said, why is, why is, there, no good, why is there no great restaurant in Wall Street? Why is there no great gym 
and Wall Street because you need both lunchtime and nighttime clientele to make a truly great place. And so when you get the people living in the city as well as working in the city, everything gets better. The city starts firing on all of its cylinders and you get this 24-hour city which is just so much more vital. There's more I could say in that category, but I'm going to move along to the safe walk, which is the biggest category and the one that's actually easiest to fix but requires the most of our attention. The safe walk used to deal with crime. Now it deals with essentially the risk of being hit by cars, which is a much, much greater risk, and trying to provide the pedestrian with the feeling that they have a fighting chance against being run over. So it all boils down to design speed. What is the speed implied by the facility? What is the road telling you to do as a driver? You are eight times as likely to die if hit by a car going 35 than if hit by a car going 25. So that threshold between, between around 30 miles an hour is really key. And most of our streets are telling drivers either to go slower than 30 or faster than 30. And we want all the different visual cues and details of the street to get that slower speed to feel normal. The first cue and the first important factor in that conversation is block size. This is Portland, Oregon, famously walkable, famously 200 foot blocks among the smallest in America. This is Salt Lake City, famously unwalkable, famously 600 foot blocks. This is a corner in Salt Lake City. They give you flags to hold up when you cross the street so you won't be hit by cars. Because, and here they are side by side, a 600-foot block city is basically a six-lane city, while a 200-foot block city is a two-lane city. And you kind of see that in the older parts of your downtown, where some streets are even just one lane, but the blocks are nice and small. This is a really important discussion. This is 24 different California cities. When you double the block size, you almost quadruple the number of fatal crashes off of the highways. So. Think about that. Double the block size, you quadruple the fatal crashes. This is your downtown. Wonderful small blocks. And this is where you say your bones are good. Right? You have the right framework for healthy, safe growth in your downtown. Here you are compared to Portland, really remarkably small, because Portland's about the smallest. It's just great. Now, there was a suggestion in one of the meetings earlier um, that <coughs> it would be easier for emergency vehicles to make their way through this tight grid because there's all these intersections, right? All these signals and stop signs. It'd be easier for, motor, for emergency vehicles to, to speed through this grid if we were to close every other street, which is true. There would be, it would be easier to zoom an ambulance or a fire truck through. But of course, there'd be four times as many people dying. So that's not a good trade-off. It's important because stuff, you know, this is why you become a city planner, so you can study cities, learn what works and learn what doesn't, and share it with the public, which has no reason that they should know that. So one thing I want to share with you that most people don't understand is that every street you close, you're killing people. And it's important not to do that for this reason. And so the parts of the city that are less safe it's important to look at the real block size. So because this is a loop, so this is a block, right? This is a block. But this is not a block. So the whole the block here is actually this big. The effective block is this large, probably about, about 10 of your downtown blocks. So when you get into the suburban model, it becomes much, le much less safe. Next is the number of lanes, as I've already implied. And... Um, uh, you know, clearly the more lanes there are, the faster cars go, the more it looks like a highway, the more lanes you have to cross when you're crossing the street. Um, but this is Oklahoma City where I learned a really interesting lesson. I was, I got to know the mayor, and Oklahoma City was named by Prevention Magazine, wait for it, as the worst city for pedestrians in the entire country. <laughs> and so the mayor came running to me and said, what do we do? How do we become more walkable? And I said, let's do a walkability study, and that was the first one of 14 that I've now done. And he said, what's a walkability study? I said, let's find out. And we looked at the downtown grid and we found, we looked at the car counts in the grid. And anyone will tell you, any engineer will tell you that a two lane road can handle 10,000 cars per day. So we looked at their roads, 
that had 5,000, 4,000, 5,000, 6,000, 4,000 cars per day. And then we looked at their downtown master plan in which they were designated as arterials and were going to be maintained or rebuilt at four, four to six lanes. And look at these counts, 10,000, 8,000, 5,000, 5,000, 4,000. So this street, which is six lanes, could rightly be a two-lane street. And we said, holy cow, there's this tremendous mismatch between supply for, of lanes and demand for lanes. We can right-size the streets around the anticipated demand, you know, anticipate some growth, but, you know, maybe make it three lanes instead of six. And so that's what we did. And happily, Devon Energy was building a, t a huge tower in the heart of the downtown and generating $200 million in tax increment and that was announced basically the day that my report came out. And they said, what can we spend all this money on? And, and we said, rebuild your downtown core, 40 blocks from building face to building face. None of the buildings, but all the streets. And that's what they decided to do. So I, I was on the team, and it was my job to design the curb to curb. You know, what's happening in the asphalt of all these streets? And we were able to double the number of on-street parking spaces and we created a bike system where there was no bike system because we took away the lanes that were completely unnecessary for free-flowing traffic. So a street like this, four lanes, becomes two lanes. Here it is under construction. And this street, which was the principal arterial through downtown, we allowed it to keep its middle, we allowed it to keep its four lanes plus turn lanes, but we limited the turn lanes to the corners and we put in nice medians and you'll notice bike lanes have found their way into these streets. So we've changed, it's about three quarters done now. Um, this is what you do, this before and after, this is what you do if you, if you have money, right? You rebuild everything. But that is very different from most places I work and most American cities and your condition. And so we've been doing a lot more conservative solutions in other cities, but the same concept. This is Cedar Rapids, Iowa. They had the farm boom and then the farm bust, and they probably had no more than 6,000 cars per day on a downtown of mostly four-lane streets and half one-way streets. And I should say Oklahoma City was half one-way. It's now all two-way. Cedar Rapids is half one-way. And they had this nice Portland grid, but they had these, you know, Salt Lake City streets. And so we said, don't, re don't rebuild, restripe. Right. You can restripe 10 streets for the price of rebuilding one street. So let's restripe your streets downtown. And right sizing them to the amount of traffic, we turn this system of mostly four laners to almost all two laners. Turn this much parking, where red is angle parking, to this much parking. And turn this bike network into this bike network. And actually, we didn't end up spending any money on it because they just took their regular allocations in which they were repaving and resurfacing streets. And every time they repave a street, they just repave it to this new standard. So that's also about half done after about four years. I mentioned one-way streets. And we're con we converted, we're converting Cedar Rapids also from half one-way to all two-way. The data is finally in. We've been arguing this intuitively for many years, but we now have the data that shows us that one-way streets, well, multi-lane one-way streets, are much more dangerous, much worse for business, um, and worse for crime than two-way streets. Principally because it feels like a highway. All these cars moving the same direction. The, the, the fact that there's two lanes means that you can jockey your mentality as a driver fundamentally changes when there's another lane you can, be, you can be in and that lane might be faster. And you stop just happily driving behind the car in front of you and you think, okay, I'm going to start looking for the opportunity to make my move. And that makes multi-lane one-way streets much more dangerous. There's a wonderful story in Governing Magazine about Vancouver, Washington, where they tried everything to bring back this main street, the, the six Bs of the 80s, the, the the berms, the bollards, the bandstands, the balloons, the, I forgot a couple. But they basically tried everything and nothing helped it come back. Finally, they got permission from the DOT to turn it from two-way to, from one-way to what you see here, which is two-way. And according to this article, um, revenue to the merchants essentially doubled almost overnight. 
Same number of cars, but now they were going two ways instead of one way. More recently, Louisville, Kentucky, these four streets were all one way. They decided to two way Brooks and First. They left second and third the same. Car crashes on the two ways went down 48%. Crime went down 23%. On the one ways, car crashes went up and crime went up. Two way streets are just safer and more prosperous. Citizens understand this when presented with the facts. This is New Albany, Indiana, where we're about to revert an entire downtown network from two way, from one way to two way. And you have your grid, which contains mostly one way streets in your downtown core. Some one ways have to be one way, right? There's no reason to mess with this really important mover of vehicles and wealth that you see here. It makes sense as a one-way pair. Then there's other streets in your downtown that are one-lane one-ways, perfectly charming and safe and comfortable, and making it two-way would mean losing the parallel parking, which would be a disaster for those businesses. So no reason to mess with those. But you have a bunch of others like Houston and Kill the Moors, Metamoros, which are one-way, multi-lane streets. I think I found four pairs, four pairs downtown that I would revert. Oop, here they are. Metamoros and Houston, Victoria and Washington, Convent and Salinas, and I think there was another, maybe it's just those three. But in any case, you know, it costs money to do this. But the experience in city after city, you know, every place I go, it, it isn't always the right solution, but when it is, People always resist it, and so I do the research, and I go back to all the places where it's been done before, and I say, does anyone regret it? And they all say, no, crime is down. Business is doing better. You know, our property values have gone up. Accidents have dropped precipitously. No one ever regrets it. So I suggest you give it a try. Here's a fun trick, and I didn't, didn't show this last time, because I didn't think it applied here, but then I found out that it did. In fact, it, ap it applies here in a remarkably powerful way because you have some very dangerous streets just like this one. A four-lane road is a dangerous road because the, the fast lane is also the turning lane. So this guy stops, maybe there's a rear-ender that happens. This guy stops to let him turn, so he turns, then this car hits him, right? It's a very dangerous situation. But it's also a very inefficient situation because the fast lane is also the turning lane. So what's remarkable is due to the inefficiency of a four-lane road, you can do what's called the classic American road diet, where you drop a lane. And that lane can become bike lanes, it can become parking lanes. You actually don't have to mess with the curbs at all. And um, this doesn't surprise anyone. Accidents drop precipitously, injury accidents in particular, because the T-bone kind of goes away, right? But this is what surprises everyone. This is 17 different road diets uh, completed around North America. If you add up the number of cars on the road before and the number after, it actually, it averages slightly higher. There is no loss in throughput, no loss in efficiency. So it's a win-win-win. You, you don't lose any traffic capacity. You gain a bike lane or a parking lane, and you save lives. So there's no reason not to do it, particularly on streets like Calton. Um, which could really use some bike lanes. Imagine Kelton is a three-laner with two bike lanes. And Jackaman, where those three ladies were hit not so long ago. Um, again, if it was three lanes, people just wouldn't go as fast on it. They might obey the speed limit, and it would be great to have some bike lanes on that street. So here's where I say for the first time in this lecture, this is a slide I've got from other lectures, but I say your codes are bad. Because not only is this, you know, not only is this four lanes, this is four 12-foot lanes, which are 70-mile-an-hour lanes. Why would you put 70-mile-an-hour lanes on a street and mark it for 35? Do you have a 2x policy, right? Why would you have a 70-mile-an-hour lane, mile-an-hour lane on a 35-mile-an-hour street? But then also, there's this. The sidewalk is allowed to be right, right next to the street. You know, until 1950, we never built streets like this. We used to have trees between the street and the sidewalk. 
And, you know, don't blame yourselves. Most American cities have removed that from their code. But if, like the forward-thinking cities are now doing, you required trees between the street and the sidewalk, then that those ladies would not have been hit. They, the trees would have been hit. So that's why I say that. Next is the width of the... I've already implied this, but the width of the lanes themselves. Andre Stuani used to show this slide and he'd say, the typical street to the typical subdivision in America is now wide enough to allow you to witness the curvature of the earth, which is kind of true. So the, 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 the standards have changed. So this is a typical subdivision from the 60s and here's one from the 80s. And look, it's the same height of airplane, but look what happens to the width of the streets, 1960s, 1980. Standards have changed such that my old neighborhood in South Beach, some of the folks from Dover Cole know Espanola Way, which next to Meridian Street, where it wasn't draining, it wasn't draining properly, so they had to rebuild it. And when they rebuilt it, even though it was perfectly fine before, the new standard kicked in and we lost half our sidewalk and our street trees because of this new ridiculous standard. So what happens on a wider street? As I've implied, lane width correlates with speed. The wider the lane, drivers know, the faster the street. So if you want drivers to go the speed limit, do not give them a super wide lane. According to one study, increased lane widths are responsible for approximately 900 fatalities per year. So my question here is, you know, we're a corrective society. We're a self-correcting society. We, we figure things out that are bad for us and we stop doing them. Um, and it's time to make that leap with lane width. Citizens understand this. In communities, they fight for narrower streets. Portland, always ahead of the curve, had its own skinny street program where they, they not only allowed but encouraged very narrow streets in their developments. And then this is blurry because it was bootlegged from an engineer's conference where it says that the new the seventh edition, the new edition of the, trans of the Traffic Engineering Handbook of the Institute of Transportation Engineers says 10 feet should be the default width for an urban lane. 10 feet used to be the width. Most cities have gone up to 11. Some have gone to 12. But 10 is much safer. In fact, 10 is 10 times safer than 12. This is severity of impact, 12-foot lane, 10-foot lane. So we really need to have 10-foot lanes as the standard. And then you've got some conditions here, like Santa Maria Avenue. I measured it. This is 31 feet. It's two lanes. So you have some conditions because of the functions of what's happening downtown. You have 15-foot lanes. You have plenty of 13-foot lanes. This one, I think it just needs, it's just awaiting the painter. A uh, lovely little street, San Bernardo, is actually one 27-foot lane. <laughs> so um, what I realized is you could do a parking lane, a bike lane, a driving lane, and a counterflow bike lane, all within this measurement, right? Seven, five, park, bike, drive, bike. So going look at, looking at downtown, I was going to do bullet points, but it didn't fit, so I'm not doing bullet points. I just walked around downtown and noticed that Santa Maria, Santa, that all these streets could use a right sizing in terms of their lanes. San, Santa Maria, San Bernardo, Grant, Itur, that's a hard one, Itorbide, Lincoln, Flores, Hidalgo, Metamoros, Houston, Victoria, San Bernardo, etc. These streets all are ready to be repainted very cheaply to right size lanes so that drivers go the right speed. And then even outside of downtown, like at the, uh, at the university, um, of course, the more modern landscape means the more modern standards. And so here you have four 12-foot lanes getting you to class, not safe. Bicycling is the biggest planning revolution currently underway in only some American cities, but many of them. In fact, probably now most of them are making big investments in bicycling. This is Portland, Oregon, where they invested $65 million in bicycling. It was over about 25 years, so not that much per year. In fact, they spent more than twice as much fixing one clover leaf in the downtown area. But they invested $65 million in biking. And I asked uh, a friend of mine 
who lives in Portland, to send me some pictures of the bike commute. And I said, what, it was this bike to work day? He said, no, this is Tuesday in Portland. Because when you invest in bike infrastructure, you get cyclists. That's the principal lesson, is that bicycling is somewhat related to climate, somewhat to topography, somewhat to culture, but mostly the number of bikers you have is a function of the number of bike lanes you have and how safe those bike lanes feel, you know? So this is Chicago. They're putting in these new lanes. And this is actually, this is the gold standard of bike lanes. It's called a protected bike lane. You pull the cars off the curb by eliminating one lane from the street because they had an extra lane that traffic said they didn't need. They pull the bikes off, they pull the cars off the curb, creates a barrier of steel that makes the bike lane safe. This guy's in the wrong lane. Here's the, then they came back and they painted them green, but this guy's still in the wrong lane. Uh, this is Prospect Park in New York City, where they took a three-laner and they made it a two-laner, and they created this protected bike lane. Of course, the number of cyclists tripled. Of course, speed, look at this, speeding. 75% of people were speeding. Now only 17% are speeding. Injury crashes down 63%. And remarkably, the, the street handles as many cars as before. Why does it handle as many cars as before? Because people were speeding from light to light and then jamming on the brakes and waiting for the light to change. So they're handling as many cars in two lanes as they used to handle in three. If, however, you don't invest in bike infrastructure and believe, as some cities do, like Pasadena, that every lane is a bike lane, then in fact no lane is a bike lane. And you will not get the bicycling population. This is the only biker I met in Pasadena. It's not a cult. Tech companies and other employers of young talent and people who wish to attract millennials are demanding bike lanes in cities. But less, aff less affluent Americans are more likely to bike for transportation. So again, if you care about equity, which we have to care about in a comprehensive plan, we realize that by improving uh, bicycle infrastructure, we're actually helping those among us who need the most help. So there's this myth in America that, you know, most citizens think that this is the typical biker. Most planners think that this is the typical biker. <laughs> but this is the typical biker in America and here. So most cyclists are working class immigrants, not hipsters. Thank you very much. And you have them here as well. Now, here's the chart that I added to show you because of the conversation today. This declining line, this is summer temperature, this is winter temperature, these are all the American states. And this bouncing, cavorting line, which bears no relationship whatsoever to temperature, is the number of bikers in each, the, the, the mode share of bicycling in each state. Now, I, I won't pretend that, that, that climate doesn't matter, but what this chart tells us is that climate is not the principal determinant of bike population, because bike infrastructure is the principal determinant of bike population. And you have some. This is Convent, but I have to pick on you because of your lane requirements. It's 11 and 11, so you've got a, you know, bike lane should be five to six feet wide, and you've got a four. So it should be 10, 10, six. So I, I recommend changing the name to Convert, so you can fix the striping. That's again why I say your codes are bad, because you have an 11 foot standard apparently. Parallel parking, an essential barrier of steel that protects the sidewalk from moving vehicles. So important. Any place where you have parallel parking that will be used, it should be in the roadway. This is Fort Lauderdale happy hour. Famous, you know, Fort Lauderdale's famous for happy hour. Notice on one side of the street you're allowed to park. On the other side, you're not allowed to park. This is happy hour on the parked side of the street, and this is happy hour on the unparked side of the street. You can't have sidewalk dining usually without parallel parking or something between you and the speeding vehicles. And then the other part of this picture, this great street, is of course the street trees, which I already mentioned, but street trees do so much. They lower temperatures a good, sometimes 10 to 15 degrees. Wouldn't that be nice? on some of your streets. They absorb storm water, they absorb ozone and CO2. Um, they increase property values, they increase sales in stores. They do, a many, they do many things, but one thing that 
they definitely do is slow cars down, sometimes abruptly. But what we've seen when streets with trees, with treed segments and untreed segments on them, when we've studied those, we find that there are fewer injuries where the trees are because cars go more slowly. This is what a street feels like. You have some of these. It's like the one I showed you earlier that didn't have street trees or parked cars. That's how it feels to be on the sidewalk. Signals. You have a lot. Um, I'm thinking principally about your downtown area. Most of your suburban arterials and collectors obviously need them. But in your downtown, this is art, by the way. This is not an actual, this may be a roundabout signal, right? No, this is just art. But um, we have more signals in America than we need. And the amazing discovery when we've gotten rid of them, when they haven't been warranted, is that streets become safer when they have four-way stop signs. The four-way stop, I call it the, the new roundabout. The four-way stop is the best solution for urban walkable intersections because no one ever speeds through it. Every car is stopping or at least coasting slowly. There's a ton of eye contact. The pedestrians look at the drivers and vice versa. The cyclists just blow right through, which is good for them. Um, but here's the study in Philadelphia where they had to remove all the unwarranted signals in 1997, and they removed 472 and studied 199, and they found that crashes went down by a quarter, and severe injury crashes went down by 63%. And severe pedestrian injury crashes went down 68%. So the four-way stop is just an amazing thing. This is funny. Traffic engineers in Philadelphia believe that the safety benefit stems from the elimination of the local habit of speeding up to beat the red. Like they only do that in Philadelphia. Um, in Cedar Rapids, when we converted the system to a two-lane system, suddenly we no longer needed signals and we're removing 11 of the 17 signals in the downtown, which is a tremendous savings. They're about to spend $150,000 each fixing up the traffic signals. So I recommend that as well in your downtown area. Then there's vocabulary. This is, this is uh, what I call objective journalism. This is the Las Vegas sun. Some say the entrance to city center is not inviting to pedestrians. <laughs> oh, really? You know, when the vocabulary is swoopy, streamline, aeroform, geometrics, that implies driving, not walking. So it's important to have clean, non-swoopy streets. And of course, wherever you do a swoopy street, you're implying an automotive environment and not a pedestrian environment, especially right here. And I picked on you about this last time, but I've only grown more, con more bold in my conviction about how embarrassed you should be about this bridge over the railroad track. And I know it's the state DOT, but this, is, this all gets back to the idea of design speed. Because this bridge, look at it, which blights two entire city blocks, destroys the opportunity, the development, this destroys the development potential of two entire city blocks as well as where it crosses. Because do you know why? It's designed to a high design speed. It's probably got a 70 mile an hour or 60 mile an hour design speed. If it was designed to a slower design speed, which is appropriate to the urban core, it could take off here and land there. And these two blocks could be developable urban blocks. So it's really important to get the design speed right. And then finishing up this category, there's a lot of fun things happening every week in planning. This week it was the discovery of these amazing, I believe Mexican crosswalks. Um, but there's no reason why you shouldn't get your artistic community together to perhaps investigate similar things here that are so interesting that they will cause people to drive more slowly. And this optical illusion crosswalk, this is from India actually, um, is particularly effective in slowing cars down. <laughs> so the last two categories are quick ones. So we're almost, we're nearing the end of the talk. Um, the comfortable walk and the interesting walk. The comfortable walk is a little bit counterintuitive because we all love our wide open spaces. We like to see out into the plains and climb mountains and see great vistas. But actually the evolutionary biologists tell us that all animals, humans among them, are simultaneously seeking prospect and refuge. You want to be able to see your predators, 
but you also need to feel that your flanks are covered from attack. If you don't feel that your flanks are covered, you're not comfortable, which is why this is like a dream. This is where you pay money to go on vacation to places like Venice. So this is actually split in Yugoslavia where the prospect is there, but the refuge is also there. And a plaza is only as good as its edges. A street is only as good as its walls. And you want to feel enclosed. You want to feel like you're in an outdoor living room when you're in a street or a plaza. You know, and the Hispanic, the, the classic Hispanic plaza is a perfect example of this. So we've been talking for many years, what's the right ratio of height to width? You know, three to one, great. One to one is the Renaissance ideal. Beyond six to one, particularly if there's no trees, beyond six to one, you start to lose that sense of spatial containment and you're no longer comfortable. So, you know, Salzburg at six to one vertically is a dream. The opposite of Salzburg, we like to say, is Houston. This is an old slide of Houston. If you've been to Houston recently, you know that so many of these parking lots have been filled in. But I keep showing this slide because it reminds us the principal villain in this conversation is the surface parking lot, which erodes the street edge and gets rid of that sense of containment. And this is from Europe, but I just want to point out you're not alone, and we Americans are not alone. This is a new city center or town center, centre, that was recently unveiled in some, you know, some British suburb. But if you start with this, if you start with the parking, well, first of all, the street's crap, you know, everything's crap. But if you start, if you start with the parking lot in front of the building, that means no one's ever going to walk on this street, at, on this sidewalk, and it means you have a driving community, not a walking community. So aside from avoiding the, the big surface parking lots that blight downtowns, the first and main lesson of good urbanism is put the parking behind, don't put the parking in front. And then, you know, this is a dream, right? This is why I think your downtown has such tremendous potential, is it has street after street of this kind of almost perfect one-to-one -one renaissance ratio of height to width, so lovely and contained. And almost no surface parking lots in your downtown. Now, I also want to talk about codes. I mentioned your codes are bad. The, the getting the parking lot behind the building instead of in front of the building is what codes are designed to do. And the typical American codes don't do that anymore, except for the new ones that, that we write. So, you know, this is the code in Washington, D.C. that I had to use when I built my house. It, it talks about something called FAR, floor area ratio. It doesn't say whether the building has to meet the street. It tells you what the FAR is. Well, FAR, you know, this is an FAR of 2.0, the most horrific apartment buildings in California. It's called a dingbat, you know, with the parking underneath. That's 2.0. This is also 2.0. They're identical in the code. This is an FAR of 1.0, and this is 1.0. This is 0 0.8, the snout house, the famous snout house, and this is 0 0.8. And the code thinks they're equal. So we need codes, and I know that part of this process is to help you change your codes so that what matters is coded and not what doesn't matter, like FAR. Your codes are bad. Finally, the interesting walk um, has to do with not being bored. You know, we humans are among the social primates. Nothing interests us more than other humans. We want signs of human life. So, you know, we, oops, we talked about the perfect one-to-one -one ratio. Well, this is the perfect one-to-one -one ratio. This is in Grand Rapids, which has quite a walkable downtown. But no one wants to walk on this street, which connects the two best hotels. Because when, you know, when one side of the street is an exposed parking deck, and the other side of the street is a conference facility that was apparently designed in admiration for that parking deck, it's just boring. It's just, it's just not interesting. So you turn around and you don't walk. And we can say what we want about architects, but um, this speaks for itself. So Joe Riley in Charleston, who was mayor for 40 years, taught us it only takes 20 feet of building to hide 200 feet of garage. And this should be the standard, lining the streets with buildings that block the parking structures from them. Um, here's one in South Beach. I call it the Chia Pet Garage that does the same thing effectively. Um, and then you have a condition on one side of a parking deck. But this is a, you know, this is a beast, what we call a B street, a street you don't expect a lot of people to walk on, so maybe this is OK. But I have to commend you for the other side, which is remarkable. I don't exactly love the, the style. But this is, this is 
one of the best solutions for an intermodal center and a parking lot edge against a green. Imagine if, imagine if, if this had faced the green. What a disaster that would have been. So I don't know, how, however many years ago, you guys were totally ahead of the curve putting this thing in, and I congratulate you for that. But that's got to be the standard as you move forward for future urban parking garages. And then there's also, in terms of interest, you know, let's face it, most of, with, with apologies to my architecture partners on this team, most modern architecture buildings kind of look the same, aren't all that interesting. But what's really interesting and what makes Loretto special are the, the, the tremendous collection of older, beautiful buildings with the high ceilings and the delicate details. And this is so important. And historic preservation has to be a huge part of keeping our places walkable because it keeps them interesting and it keeps them unique. And there's a wonderful economist, his name's Don Ripkema, and he talks about the value of historic preservation as an economist. And he says, in economics, it's the differentiated product that commands a monetary premium. A community which in the long term wants to be a valuable place needs to identify its attributes that add to its different differentiation from anywhere else. And for you guys, that's your historic architecture in your downtown core. So I know that some of it's endangered, not all of it's protected, and it really needs to be for your, for your success economically as a community. Finally, in this interesting category, you know, sometimes you've just got a blank wall that needs something interesting on it. I worked at the National Endowment for the Arts for four years. I gave a lot of grants supporting public art. Um, I think there's been a big evolution in public art in the U.S. It used to be what they called plop art, you know, the, the inscrutable sculpture that lands on a plaza and somehow is supposed to make it beautiful. But for me, the role, the principal role of public art is, is remedial. It's to take boring places and make them interesting. And so I would encourage you, to the degree that you have a public art budget or are committed to spending money on that, that you think about where the blank walls are, where the dead zones are, that you can make lively. So this is, of course, you know, this is the American version. Here's the European version. But, you know, as they tell me, Jeff, keep it clean. So, you know, that's the role of art. That's the role art can play in our society. And it doesn't have to be, you know, on a big scale. People didn't want to walk up these steps, and now maybe they're more likely to walk up these steps because of that little detail. So those are the four categories, and you need to do all of them, which means you need to figure out where doing all of them is possible. And that's where you can have that walkable lifestyle that we talked about, and you focus your energy there, start small. And I was reading my New Yorker yesterday, and I, it was yesterday, it's the brand new New Yorker, and I love this quote, it was uh, Adam Gopnik is reviewing a new book about Jane Jacobs, and he says, first, cities are their streets. Streets are not a city's veins, but it's neurology, it's accumulated intelligence. Streets are a city's accumulated intelligence, and cities are their streets. And that's why your streets are so important, because they really are your city. So that's why I focus on downtown. And, you know, this plans for the whole city, and Mario said, Jeff, you know, we need to talk about the whole city. But I'm talking about walkability. And, and the place where walkability is most possible is in your downtown core. Now, just because you don't live in the downtown doesn't mean that shouldn't matter to you. Wherever you live in the city, you really have two places that are yours. Your neighborhood is yours, and the downtown is yours. The downtown is the one part of the city that belongs to everybody, and everyone can take pride in or not, depending on its quality. So it's really worth your effort in doing a comprehensive plan that looks at the whole city to understand the whole city will rise or fall on the success of its downtown. And I ask you to focus your energy there. Ending with a little recent history, those of you who were here, was it last night? Was it that recently? Those of you who were, who were here last night were asked to name the one word that you thought characterized the city currently. And this is the diagram of all the words that you chose. Interesting focus on boring. Don't know if I've seen that before. Um, but then you were asked to describe Loretto in the future. And um, Jason mentioned that this is one of the first, I don't usually do this, but Jason's team at Dover Cole usually does this. He said this is the first city they've done where there's like no negative words in the future vision. There's usually a lot of 
pessimism. Also interesting that city is such a big word. That means your aspirations are quite urban. No, but I thought that was fascinating um, to go from so negative to so positive. So you know, I would say this, I'd add one more word, which is perhaps honest. And here I'd add one more word, which is ambitious. And seeing that distinction makes me very confident about the future of this comprehensive plan and the future of Laredo and your role in it. So thank you for listening. Here is the book that I hope you will read. Here's the other two books that if you're a junkie about this stuff, I hope you will read, The S Suburban Nation and The Smart Growth Manual. Um, and then, because this has happened before, people from down here have come before, I just want to let you know, I teach a class at Harvard every summer that's a two-day class in this. And this was last year, but we'll figure out when it is next year. If you are interested in coming next year, please tweet at me. It's not cheap, and you have to get all the way to Harvard, but they give you a piece of paper that looks like you went to Harvard. So <laughs> it's really awesome. Um, and then you can tweet at me. And I'm on Twitter, so my, you know, my personal self-worth is a function of how many followers I have, so I hope you'll follow me at uh, Jeff Speck AICP, a American Institute of, what is it, Certified Planners? City Plan. Um, so that's it, but I've got the book signing now. So I, I'm, I'm, I think it's a little late, and I probably shouldn't take questions, um, except personally afterwards. Uh, but please come meet me at the table, even if you don't want to buy a book. And I thank you so much for your attention. <laughs>